from a piece of optics as small as this one to a primary mural as large as the Palomar Hale telescope, and it's 200 inch or 5 meter diameter, telescopes maker in general do spend a lot of energy to provide and maintain optic optimal surface quality for the optics that are used in imaging astronomy. In fact, if you look at most specifications for the optics that are used in everyday astronomy, you realize that the optical surface quality, the, the typical error, the roughness errors on the surface of the optics, is typically somewhere between lambda over 10 to lambda over 100. That means that the typical errors are smaller than a tenth of the wavelength, or even a hundredth of the wavelength um, in the most uh, demanding cases. Now, if you compare that to the requirement we've set in order to be able to witness interferences, um, the constraint that was imposed by the coherence length, you realize that the optical quality of most telescopes is orders of magnitude better than this uh, coherence length requirement that we've uh, set earlier. And so it is no surprise that early day astronomers uh, were able to produce interference fringes by simply using a telescope, an aperture mask. By design, a telescope is going to guarantee equal path traveled uh, from the surface of the primary, uh, from the star itself, all the way down to the detector. And uh, if you put an aperture mask in front of your telescope, you are going to be able to observe interference fringes there. Now, it becomes a little trickier when you think about trying to achieve the same thing using two separate telescopes. So here I've labeled uh, T1 and T2, my two telescopes, that are separated by a pretty large distance that we're going to call the baseline, um, B12. That can be several times or several tens or hundreds of times the size of the telescope, the, di the diameter of the telescope itself, you know, a few hundreds of meters. How would you proceed? Um, the most sensible thing in order to witness, to observe interference fringes, uh, would be to put your focal station, the instrument that is going to collect the light from the two telescopes, at the exact halfway point between the telescopes. Um, you do that so as to ensure that the light path that is traveled by the light along the two interferometric arms is such that the light on the two arms reaches the detector at the exact same time uh, to within the coherence time, of course. And if you do so, you're going to be able to observe your interference fringes. Now we're going to um, use a lot more optics than just the optics of the telescopes themselves in order to send the light from the telescopes to the focal station. And we refer to these optics as, as uh, beam transportation optics, or BTU for short. And another special place is of course going to be in the system, the focal lab itself, which we're going to cover in a bit more details in a later section. But if you do um, put your focal station at the exact halfway point, um, assuming that you're observing a, a target that is exactly above you at the zenith, then you're going to be able to observe interference fringes at this exact halfway point. The catch is, if you've ever been out at night and looked at the sky for more than a few seconds, uh, you know that nothing stays exactly above uh, your head for very long, uh, simply because the Earth is spinning on its axis. Uh, as the night progresses, we simply see stars and planets and everything uh, on the celestial sphere, drift westward. And so no object, no target is actually going to uh, stay exactly at zenith for more than a fraction of a second. Maybe. And that is going to have some consequences on the um, architecture of our interferometer. If we want to observe something that is off zenith, the first thing we're going to have to do is, of course, to repoint our telescopes to make sure that we can actually couple the light of this star into our interferometer. And although we do couple that light into our interferometer, if we don't change anything about our architecture, we're going to 
uh, not be able to see any fringes at the focus. Now, why is that? Is although we've ensured that the light path is equal along our interferometric arms, by changing the pointing, we introduce an additional optical path difference on one of the telescopes. If you look at the yellow lines that are printed on the, the drawing here, you are going to see that the light of the target reaches telescope T1 before it reaches telescope T2. And the fact that there is a very long distance between our two telescopes is such that the optical path difference this introduces can be very large, up to um, tens or even close to 100 meters in some cases, if you try to point very far away from uh, Zenith. How do you address this? You're going to have to change uh, your architecture and introduce on one of the arms of your interferometer an extension uh, that is going to uh, delay the light by some amount that exactly matches the optical path difference that is introduced by the pointing. And in doing so, you're going to make sure that the light again reaches your focal plane at the exact same time on, uh, for the two interferometric arms. And in this case, you're going to uh, recover your fringes. We call this additional uh, light extension a delay line. And this, of course, needs to be adjusted as the pointing changes uh, as the objects uh, move across transit. And of course, if you want to track over the entire transit uh, uh, before and after the star you look, you're observing, or the target you're interested in observing, uh, crosses the meridian, then you're going to have uh, not just one, but two delay lines and many moving parts in order to make sure that as the star crosses the, the, the sky, you are maintaining equal path on the two interferometric arms. If you look at pictures of interferometers, usually you only think of uh, the telescopes that make up the interferometer, what's on the surface. Now, once the light is uh, collected by these telescopes, what is hidden is the, um, the long tunnels that are used to maintain uh, this, um, this equal path requirement here. And uh, here's an example of uh, the uh, Keck interferometer delay line, which is a very long tunnel over which some trolley are running pretty fast to, to, uh, uh, as the, the pointing of the telescopes changes uh, when they are operating in interferometric mode. And you have the same sort of installation, of course, at uh, VLTI. Um, and here you have a picture of the actual trolley uh, going over the, um, the, the, the long track that uh, ensures that we're going to maintain optical path difference. And if you look at the specifications for these uh, delay lines, you realize that it's pretty uh, amazing technology there. Uh, for the VLTI example, the, um, the, the delay line specifications are an, a total travel path of about 60 meters for the trolley itself, which if you account for the fact that the light goes back and forth, makes for an optical path range that goes from 0 to 120 meters tops. Um, you have to um, do this with a very good uh, resolution and in, in uh, using the, the fine correction systems that they have on the trolley, you can actually maintain an optical path resolution of about 20 nanometers in some cases. You have very good repeatability of the system. And if you do the applications, you'll realize that uh, this trolley needs to move pretty fast. And so this system is designed to accommodate displacements that goes as fast as 50 centimeters per second, which is pretty impressive. The trolley itself is very interesting. Uh, it is a system designed to, uh, um, like, a, like a telescope, uh, with a light coming, out, coming in and light getting out of it, uh, making sure that um, and the trolley itself is going to move along its track, and that's going to uh, ensure what I would call coarse positioning to, you know, within a few millimeters to a few hundreds of microns. And on top of this, you're going to have um, at the uh, center, on one of the reflections here, a very fine piezo-driven stage that's going to ensure that the optical path difference 
stays well within the coherent strength requirement. With all of this in place, we are finally ready to move on to look at what's going to happen once the light reaches the focal recombiner, which is going to be what we'll see just next.